So welcome everyone. I've got uh, some housekeeping to mention to you. Um, we're the last ones here, so we need to turn off the lights when we leave. <laughs> and uh, after this session, it's the last session, we have a party. Uh, I think it's on the fifth floor. Free drinks, free food, free everything. But I asked security to close the doors. You're not allowed to leave until I'm finished. And I've got a lot of slides. <laughs> no, kidding. Um, so, let's get started. Um, this is a session about how you can secure social media accounts using Azure AD uh, technologies. I've been investigating that and see what Azure AD and its solution components could do uh, uh, to it. And uh, I would like to share my experiences that I found during tests and uh, in the investigation. Um, my name is Jorty Almeida Pinto. Uh, I'm based in the Netherlands, currently working for the Rabobank. I've been an MVP since 2006, uh, started as a directory services MVP, and in 2016 they basically migrated a lot of on-prem MVPs to be cloud-based MVPs, so I'm suddenly an enterprise mobility and security MVP um, since 2016. Um, I've got a blog, Facebook, Twitter, and before I continue with the next slide, I want to start up a script that needs to send an email because if during the demo, uh, I don't want to wait for it, so I'm going to start it right now. Why? Is there a difference? <laughs> yeah, I know. But I, I need to replace that one. Yeah, so, um, yeah, the script. So I'm going to clean up, so, um, no, in this case, invite a business-to-business -business guest account. And I wrote a PowerShell script to do that for me. I send a custom email and do all that kind of stuff. And yes, I want to continue. So it created a business to business account um, and it will wait some time before it will send the custom SMTP, uh, before it will send the custom message um, uh, through a custom SMTP to the recipient. So let's wait for that part to see if it finishes correctly. <clears throat> and then hopefully when a demo starts, the email has arrived. Very nice. So let's go back. So first, oh, sorry. I just want to say I'm very happy that your script does date formatting in a format that I appreciate. You do year, month, day, then 24 hour time. I, that's my default. That's my yes. default. Yes. I'm trying to get everybody <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Okay. It's a battle. Who knows? Who knows? At least, well, let's say that the first three social media networks, or at least networks that were considered social media, and if you're able to also mention that, the year that. So. MySpace. Too new. Older. Older. Sorry? Older. Older. Yes. Older than America Online. Talk to you, sir. Sorry, I Orkut? don't know that one. No. Talk to you, sir. No. <laughs> ARPANET. Oh. That old. It was considered. I didn't know it because I had to look it up. I looked it up and so on um, on Wikipedia, and I found out this was this was considered the first social media network. There's another one. And I. It's kind of, no, that's kind of. Bulletin board system. When I started off with my first computers, I was uh, working, or at least busy, with bulletin board system because a friend of mine had one. Anyone used bulletin board systems in the past? GBBS yeah, downloading software. That's not really a network, right? But that was fine with that, 
Sorry? Okay. Well, yeah. And as you can see over here, <laughs> you can see that Google was available in the old in the old style, and but they cancelled the API uh, in May 2016. So as you can see, I tried to look it up, uh, Hybrid Identity Conference, but it wasn't available anymore. So that was a shame. And there's a the last one, Usenet. Those, these are the first three social, well, at least the ones that are considered social media network. So, why do we, why do we even use social media? I, as a person, use social media for myself and to either profile me because I'm an MVP and I'm sharing information with others, uh, networking with others, sharing personal data as in pictures or stories, experience, etc. Companies basically do exactly the same thing, but for different purposes. Marketing, sales, advertising, customer services, and all kinds of other uh, uh, purposes. Another one is, for example, app development. And because social media is so powerful, it's also dangerous in another way, because it, can, it contains a lot of information about a person or a company, and, um, um, and for hackers, it's valuable. So for hackers, it's like a candy store. And of course, they want to have access to that to misuse it in their own way. It can either make you or break you. <clears throat> Business identity theft. We all know consumer identity theft, where somebody assumes the, 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 the identity of somebody else because somebody else made, for example, a stupid mistake. For example, in the Netherlands, where people sell something on a website, and then some person, yeah, can you please send me a copy of your passport? And basically, people just share it. Another one that I found, last week, I attended a, a certified ethical hacker training. And that's when I learned, learned all the possible ways that you can do bad stuff. And it's a lot what you can do with somebody's computer or even something that has a network plug on it. For example, there's a website where you are able to look for um, IoT devices. And then you can look and then try to access them. And some are just open. We browsed on somebody's NAS on the other uh, uh, side of the world. We didn't open anything because that's not allowed, but we were able to browse and look for documents pictures, whatever. So how difficult is it to steal somebody's identity? The same also applies for the business, because if somebody steals the business identity, you can impersonate the business and do all kinds of bad stuff. And then in the end, you can have reputational damages. The other one, data leakage, data that belongs to the customer or belongs to the company itself, or financial damage. Bad guys trying to um, get money out of customers, users, or the company itself. <clears throat> so why can it go wrong? First of all, social media can be hacked. And I got this chart, if you want to call it a chart, of all the biggest data breaches ever. And it didn't fit on my screen because otherwise, and it's, it's huge. Stolen passwords. Many have been compromised where passwords were stolen. And I, have I been pawned one of those websites that publishes that? Another one is Facebook. Recently, stolen tokens. Well, it, they were not stolen, but due to bugs in the system, hackers were able to regenerate tokens and therefore, let, let's say they were stolen, and then basically log in as the person of, uh, uh, of the account. And of course, all kinds of other data that is stolen uh, um, uh, from social media networks or whatever other network. Basically, if a system is not protected enough or if it's open, uh, data can be stolen, even without you knowing it. So what's the problem with social media? Social media, what I've learned is it's set up by the business. Almost no, if none at all, no IT involvement. So it's a regular user, it's a person like, for example, being at home, oh, I need a social media account. 
goes to the website, sets it up. If, you're luck if they're lucky, they will enable MFA or even use a strong password. But that's what they did at home, they will also do at the company. Same strengths or weaknesses or whatever, it will be exactly the same. Because the person doesn't have the knowledge on how they can protect their online identity. Until IT gets involved and then you find out, oh shoot, this is really a mess. We need to do something about it. Some examples why it can go wrong. Password generation. How is the password being generated? Is it machine-based? Is it some logic because uh, your birth date, your dog's name, etc.? cetera? Um, information that can be found somewhere. And of course, how frequent it's going to be changed. Last week, as I mentioned, certified ethical hacker training, there was a person with a microphone on the street, walk up to p uh, different people and started talking to them. You cannot imagine how much information they got out of the person and in the end guessing the password. People just basically gave everything and you'll be surprised how easy it is to get information out of people. So let's look at passwords. What does a, let's say, a non-IT person consider a strong password? This is strong. And if you ask them to change their password, it will be something similar. This is what IT thinks about it. I think this is a 30 character long and it's machine generated. <clears throat> the downside of it, nobody can remember this. Right. So you need a password manager or something similar to it. Another one. Are, is the business using one single password for all the social media accounts or is it different for every social media account? You need to investigate that. Distribution. With regards to social media, you might have a case where a team of people use that social media of the, 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 of the company. How are they going to distribute the password? Is it being emailed along with the username? Or is it, for example, use the email for the username and WhatsApp or whatever for the password? And how about external parties? Because you might have some service provider with regards to social media doing or providing some service for you. How are they going to distribute the password for, that, for, the, for those people? And then again, if you look at the external company, how are they going to distribute the password to their colleagues? You have no idea. So, things to worry. And then, after distributing it, where and how is it going to be stored? Is it going to be on a post-it? Is it uh, in some text file, email, whatever? I would hope at least a password manager, but you'll never know. Another one, entering, and this also applies, mostly applies to, to uh, personal uh, social media usage, is entering credential information on non-secured networks. HTTP ones, but also public Wi-Fi, even if you have an HTTPS over, in, uh, over public Wi-Fi. If the public Wi-Fi has a uh, termination, in the end it still gets the information and you think you are secure. For example, I myself, I'm using a VPN solution. If I use, uh, even now, um, if I connect over public Wi-Fi, I'm using a VPN solution. Because when I enter whatever information, especially if it's credentials or sensitive information, I don't want it to be compromised because I'm using a public Wi-Fi. MFA not being used. My, my personal perspective is, if you can enable MFA, you should enable MFA. I have, for, me, for myself, my phone has the Microsoft Authenticator app, and I think it's, it has about 40 to 50 accounts where MFA is enabled. And every day when I found out, find out that some service provides MFA and I still have not enabled it, I will enable it immediately. I will even tell my wife to enable it for herself because sometimes we share accounts and we don't, I don't want to, to get into a situation where I have to rescue her because something was stolen and she's the regular user. <laughs> Logging on to non-compliant, non-managed public devices, stealing credentials, stealing data, 
I remember being on vacation and then public computer while my wife was shopping I was waiting basically logging on checking email and when you go to the uh, credentials field what do you see all the credentials of all the people that ever used that machine they they start the password they start the credentials and then basically they log off and they go away and I was like come on guys it's so easy people don't are not aware of what can happen and what they're doing so without even knowing that they're compromising themselves already another one is for how do you give access to social media at, at least for for in a, in a company perspective you can for example have one account and then distribute the account to uh, uh, account credentials to everyone or like in uh, Facebook and LinkedIn you are able to couple somebody's personal account to the company account so the person logs on with its uh, LinkedIn account and goes to the web page of the company and he has access or she has access so but in that case how do you differentiate between messages sent from a personal perspective and sent for a company's perspective there might be a reason that somebody that or at least that person has a hobby that the company doesn't want to be uh, does not want to be related with could be discriminating or whatever hurtful for other people so where do you make the difference how about access review provisioning deprovisioning what happens if the person leaves the company are you aware that you need to remove the account from your LinkedIn uh, company LinkedIn profile who knows hopefully they do so and suddenly because people are using their personal account your company's the security of the the, the, the company um, social media account is suddenly related with the security of your personal account so if the security of your personal account is crap weak password weak everything no MFA whatever you might strengthen the whole social media account from on one side but it's open and weak on the other side because it's using a personal account uh, by some some person so at that point I would say no personal accounts tied to company-based accounts <clears throat> social management tooling at first I didn't even know it existed but it exists there's tooling on the market, different vendors, and they provide a solution to manage your social media. One that I saw was that, and I'm not going to name any names because that wouldn't be nice, but one of the tools that I f uh, saw was that it had basically no security. It had an account, you could provide a password, that's it. No MFA, no policies, nothing. And it was, even, it was not even possible to connect to either ADFS or Azure to provide federated logon. Basically, you couldn't do anything. It may, be, may have been rich from a social management perspective, but from a security perspective, it was really bad. So, in general, and I'm not going to, because these are open doors, but I will... Uh, I will we'll mention a few things as, uh, with some of them. Do you re okay, how many of you use, for example, Google or Facebook as your social media provider to log on to whatever sites that accepts that social media provider? Anyone else? I don't. I don't trust Facebook. <laughs> no, seriously. I use it, but I don't trust it from an authentication perspective. So, George, I've got Google, right? Google Directory protecting my username and password mm -hmm. or I've got awesomeapp55.com asking for a username and password you so, so you're suggesting that awesomeapp55 is going to do as good or better a job of securing my username and password than Google does I mean why not why not do an OAuth login from Google to awesomeapp55 well, I'm, I'm referring to the case where Facebook was hacked and by f hacking Facebook, suddenly you have access to all kinds of other websites. And in my perspective, I prefer to have one uh, credential for every website because all my credentials are different. Different usernames, 
and different machine-generated passwords. So if they would hack Facebook, and basically they did, I don't have an issue because Well, yeah, but but it depends on the scenario. There are multiple, but that, that's my thought. I prefer to have different things for different websites, especially when it comes to social media. <clears throat> Unique and strong passwords. This is how I generate my passwords using LastPass, and I also use it as a password manager. So, who changes their passwords on a regular basis? It's painful. <laughs> it's really painful. Yeah, I did it once, but I don't do it uh, every week, every month, uh, maybe every year or so. Well, from, a co from a company perspective, it should generate a string in it, and I store it in my password manager. Because I only need it when I need to recover, so I won't need it every day. So if that's the case, I will copy-paste it. That's it. Password manager, uh, yeah, sure, don't store all your passwords in email words and all that stuff. Open doors. Recovery info, email, make sure it's enabled. Believe it or not, but while testing last week, I locked myself out of, out of my Pinterest account while even recovery information was available. <laughs> so what happened was that um, <clears throat> I enabled two-factor authentication and it said, we will send you an SMS. And for whatever reason, the system detected that I had Authy on my phone. But I have Authy on three devices. On my tablet, on my phone, and on my wife's phone. And instead of sending the SMS, it, was, it looked like as it was jumping around between devices. So I never knew which code to enter. So I entered my backup code, which was just one code. I entered, I was able to get in. And I logged off. I couldn't log on anymore. Why? The backup code apparently was only, uh, could only be used for one time. But the system didn't warn me to change it. I got locked. Now I'm trying to get in again but to the Pinterest service desk. Guys, can you please let me in, disable MFA, whatever, because I can't get in anymore. <laughs> They're like, we don't think They're like, you Yeah, that's, that, that's the fight that I'm having right now. Prove it's you. Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, there's a picture in there for me. <laughs> so. Oh, it's it's no 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 no. It's it's. I'm using Pinterest because I was using it for 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 a demo, and I locked myself out, so I had to move to Instagram. <laughs> So basically, I was locked out of everything. <laughs> uh, well, the insecure connections, I uh, already talked about that. Um, these two are interesting. Um, how many times have you seen that, for, especially on Facebook, that's what I'm seeing. Uh, well, hey, what's your favorite car? Or what's your favorite teacher? And then oh, yeah. tons of people entering the information. And that's basically, and I don't know who, but sorry? People are asking for information, and it's really easy. <clears throat> oh, the short links one. Also interesting, because if you get an email, and it might, it might look real, what, how do you know what the link is behind the short link? You don't. And for example, this is one of the websites that I found. You put in the short link in, and it will show you the real link behind it. At a high level, using Azure AD as the identity provider, using the access panel to publish the applications, conditional access to define the conditions of when access or where, uh, from where access is allowed, groups to assign the authorizations, and the password-based sign-in to provide SSO translators from your corporate credentials. And then from an identity perspective, internally you can use anything that's available from Azure AD, a cloud-only account, PTA, uh, password hash sync, federated, it doesn't really matter. And from an external perspective, any supported form of bi a bi business to business and any identity provider that you can uh, source from that. Processes, processes, processes. Even internally you already have processes, but also from an external perspective you need to have processes to provision 
and even deep revision accounts, but also perform access reviews and uh, per periodically see if everything still is as it should be. Another one is also when uh, onboarding applications, you also need to offboard applications because everybody comes to your desk asking, hey, I need this application. Nobody comes to your desk, hey, you can clean it up. <laughs> Nobody. So uh, I don't know how you are doing within your company, but uh, f uh, 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 using ADFS as an example, we have an onboarding um, uh, process where we ask all kinds of information. And periodically, I think uh, every half a year or a year, we ask the business owner, hey, we have an application for you. Do you still need it? And the only answer I want to hear is yes or no. If it's yes, we extend the date. If it's no, we will disable it immediately. Half a year later, we will delete it. And for Azure AD, it should be the same. Otherwise, it will pile up and pile up and pile up. And in the end, it's a mess. And nobody dares to even throw it away because you don't even know if it's even being used. Yeah, you can use all kinds of reporting in Azure AD, but it's still additional work. Well, who is using social media? Already mentioned that. Web care, customer services, marketing, uh, sales, whatever. You need to uh, hunt them down. And then for every uh, department or team or whatever, which social media platforms are, are they using? And how many accounts do they have? And are those accounts being shared with other departments? And then everything around that. It, from the beginning, you might think, oh, it's just one department, and they have Google, oh, sorry, they have, for example, Twitter, and they have their own account, and another department has, also has their own account. Nope. In this case, it might be that they have their own accounts, and for whatever reason, they help each other, and they have accounts of both departments and other departments might still have those credentials, so. <clears throat> and another one, what's the purpose, the reason for mentioning that is, is it possible to consolidate? Because you, if you can consolidate uh, social media accounts, you should do so. And for every social media account, who is responsible, accountable, or any delegates, why are those people important? Um, the access reviews. Somebody needs to review the access, approve or deny, whatever. Somebody needs to be able to do that or at least delegate to somebody else. So you need that information. And who's using the account internally? Like I mentioned, one department, multiple departments. Is it also being used externally? How is it being shared? How is it being distributed? You need to know all that information. Uh, for example, if all the people internally are in the same room, then you would be able to enable MFA on the social media account itself because they might have a central phone where, for example, the SMS is coming in. If the social media account supports um, uh, an OTP through email, well, yeah, then you have a functional mailbox where that information comes in and then it doesn't really matter where you are. But if it's phone-based, are they in the same room? And how is it being accessed? Is it username and password or is it delegated to a personal account? We found both. And I'm talking to the security guys. Do you think this is acceptable? And their first answer was, no, it isn't. <laughs> because the security is suddenly tied to a personal social media account. And is MF MFA enabled? And has the information been set? Important. Social man management tooling, uh, as I mentioned before, who's using it, how is it being used, which accounts are in there, because what we also found was people, some people were accessing it directly, some people were accessing through the social management tool. You need to see, okay, are we going to use this way, I'm going to use the other way, or will we keep both ways? <clears throat> From the client side perspective, what do we need? In the end, when you access an application on the access panel, as soon as you click on it, Azure AD starts to doing its magic. And basically what it does is it pulls the password that has been stored in Azure AD and it injects it into the social media uh, sign-in form. And you need an extension for that. And the extension is available for the major browsers, Internet Explorer, Edge, Firefox, and Chrome, and all the others, it's not supported. If you're on a mobile device, if you are using the Intune Managed Browser or the My Apps uh, Azure AD app, um, it by default contains the uh, extension, required extension already. So this solution will only work if you have the extension. No extension means it won't ever work.
because it needs to inject the password. And if the extension is not installed, it will warn you. Please install now. And if you are using Firefox and Chrome, it will install easily. But if it's Edge, you need to have access to the Microsoft Store. And if it's Internet Explorer, it's an MSI. You need to have the permissions to install it. And maybe most of the people within a company don't have admin permissions uh, on their systems. So. You need to allow this extension to work. So if you're using blacklist, whitelist, at least whitelist it. Otherwise, like I mentioned, it, if it's not available, it won't work. Um, one of the downsides that I found is even though you are injecting the password into the session, it might still be cached. So for whatever browser you're using, disallow caching of passwords. And another one is if you have the ability to use debugging tools and you have the debugging tool running, you see which password is being injected. And then in the end, just the people still know which password is being used. And the whole reason for the solution is they shouldn't know the password. Another one, in, uh, in private incognito mode only works when extensions have been enabled for that mode. Some browsers have it enabled by default, others don't. So you need to check if it's enabled or not, and if, of course, you want to use it. And one of the best experiences is it doesn't cache anything. Because if stuff's getting cached, uh, through cookies, the cookie takes precedence over what's being injected. Is an issue when you have multiple social media accounts for the same social media provider. Then you start to having a fight between the cookie and the, inject, uh, the, the credentials being injected. And trust me, the cookie always wins. So from some scenarios, cookie are nice thing to have, but in this scenario, cookies are a bad thing. <clears throat> the difference between gallery apps and non-gallery apps, the general thing between them is you need to enable them from password-based sign-on. Oh, sorry. And then as soon as you have enabled the application for password-based sign-on, um, sorry, that's the next thing. From assignment of permissions, on the application itself, you assign a group. And then on that group, that's where you specify the credentials being used by the members of that group against the social media. You have a question? No. No? Okay. <laughs> so, and you can provide the credentials um, um, as soon as you specify the group. If you're specifying multiple groups, which is possible, you're not able to specify the credentials for, uh, for every individual group. You need to specify it afterwards by going to the group and then uh, say update credentials. Uh, but if it's just one group, you can specify the credentials right from the beginning. And then you also need to decide if you want to enable this checkbox or not. And this checkbox basically will rotate your password off your social media account periodically. Uh, to be honest, I don't know what the period is for the rotation. Do you guys know? Okay. Well, if you enable this, make sure the, make sure the recovery information is uh, uh, available on the social media card. Because if it changes and it rotates and you need to get in for whatever reason, the only way of getting in is through the recovery information. SMS, uh, LTP, email, whatever. <coughs> And then the real difference is that for the gallery application, the sign-in URLs and the credentials field are already known. Microsoft already specified them, so you don't have to figure it out. No hassle, no additional work, it just works. But if you have a custom application like this one, it's a uh, Dutch social media complaint site, for customers, if somebody, some company didn't provide a good service or whatever, they go and complain over there. And then uh, if the company is, uh, uh, really wants it, uh, tries to still solve the, the, the problem, etc. But this, as you can see, I provided the sign-in URL. And it says, hey, we couldn't find the, si the, the sign-in fields. So you need to help the application through Azure AD to find it. And it might need some digging depending on the scenario. Because if you look at this one, iTunes Connect 
to be able to publish his applications to, for the web store, um, I, went in, I went into the sign-in uh, URL, which the one you just browsed to, and then entered it over here, and it didn't find any, uh, any uh, sign-in field. So it took me quite a long time to figure it out, but what I did was Microsoft didn't have this one in the gallery, but it had other applications defined in the gallery that also belonged to Apple. What I found out was is that all those applications had this structure for the identity provided within Apple, and it requires some key ID at the end. And I was like, well, probably iTunes, connects, iTunes Connect works the same way. So I opened up my debugger, and then when I hit the page, I found out, hey, this is the key ID. So I put in the key ID and then provided that as the sign-in URL, and then Azure mentioned, yay, I found sign-in fields. And it worked. So it might take some time. And as soon as, if it's a custom application, <laughs> I'm not even sure I will finish it within five minutes, but okay. <laughs> um, if it's a custom application, I really advise you to at least go through these steps, capture the sign in fields, test it, well, te always test it manually to see if it works, and then tells you, yeah, we found something. And when you do so, you will see, hey, metadata, uh, metadata capture is in progress. And then when you're done, it will tell, yeah, it was captured. You click save, and you're done. And another one that I found out was make sure you, you saw when I provided the, 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 the specified the group, you were able to specify the credentials. And if you paid attention, you saw that the, 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 the password was uh, not displayed. In this case, it was being displayed. So it was being displayed, and if you click save, it won't store them securely, but if you open up later, it still displays the, the, the password. So for this one, it was apparently the incorrect sign-in URL, so I had to dig in again until I found out the correct one that hid the password. So again, for some applications, you might need to do some digging to find in the, the correct sign-in URL. <clears throat> One department might have, for example, multiple Twitter accounts, or inst multiple Instagram, or multiple Facebook, or multiple whatever. How to deal with them? Well, one of the solutions is to, in this case it's Instagram, create multiple um, application definitions in Azure. It works, and then every application definition has its own group with its own set of credentials. There's a better way. <clears throat> this is not the way. This is the way. You still define one application, Instagram, and by the way, I prefixed them with social because it really eases in, in searching for the application in my apps panel. And then specify all the groups, and then for every group, specify the corresponding credentials. It works. So if, for example, Joe is a member of this group, and I'm a member of this group, I will automatically log on with this uh, credential, and Joe will log on with this credential. But if I'm a member, let's say that if I'm a member of both groups, Azure AD will provide you a screen, hey, choose which account you want to sign in. But there's a catch. <clears throat> because cookies are enabled, if I click the top one, it will inject the credentials from the top one, from account one. What do you guys do when you go to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, I don't care, whatever website you're visiting, what do you do when you log off? What do you do? Close the browser. Close the browser. Does anyone actually go to account and then log off to clear or invalidate a cookie? Nobody does that. But what happens when you close the browser? The cookie, the cookie is not invalidated. So the cookie is not invalidated for account one, and then afterwards, oh, I need to go to account two. So you see Azure AD injects the credentials for account two into the, the form, but the cookie wins. Suddenly you see, this, so you need to be aware of that, that <laughs> um, 
You might think, hey, I'm logged on with account two, and you start typing stuff and publishing them, and oh, this was account one. Cookie is, so that's what I mentioned. If you use, for example, in private or in Kibnita mode, as soon as you close the session, cookies are gone. But if you switch in, uh, between accounts in the same session, same problem. <clears throat> so, which type of identities um, do you have? Cloud only, using native Azure AD authentication. Hybrid identity. All forms, password hash sync. Seamless SSO using native uh, authentication. PTA or federation. I'm not going to the, uh, all the other stuff so that we can finish as much as soon as possible because we have a party and I don't, we the person, don't want to be the person between you and the free drinks and food, so sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, if you had password hashing to these two, then you have the same uh, additional benefits of leak credentials and disaster recovery if uh, ADFS or PTA, uh, sorry, AD for whatever reason dies because using PHS, there is no dependency with any on-prep infrastructure. <clears throat> and if you still need help to choose, go to that website. So, Azure B2B, that's the solution for external identities. What are, so the B2B concept, who doesn't know about the B2B concept? Don't be afraid in raising your hand, because if you don't, I'll explain it. You don't? Okay, B2B. Um, when I provide, for example, an, uh, a set of applications to uh, an additional partner, you will be accessing those applications through my tenant because I'm publishing them on my tenant and I'm providing them to you. But for you to be able to, ac uh, to access them, you need to have a guest user account in my tenant. And how do you get a guest user account? For whatever reason, I need to have your, let's say, email address so that I can send you an invitation, because during the invitation the account is created, you may or may not get an invitation that you need to accept, and then as soon as you accept it, the guest account is um, made available for you. And then as soon as you authenticate against your uh, identity provider and come to my tenant, having a token for that account, you can access the application. That's how, uh, how it works. How, you, how can you create the, 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 the invitations? an administrator through the Azure AD portal, uh, the Microsoft Graph, or a PowerShell script, like, a, like the PowerShell script that I used, use it, sending a, a, a custom uh, email message. <clears throat> and then, like I mentioned, the external identity provider, whatever that is, will authenticate you as soon as the guest account is there. Um, but before doing that, and I think there was already a discussion, I don't, I'm not sure it was you, uh, Guy, that mentioned, you are suddenly trusting somebody else. So if you're trusting another company to access your resources, at least make sure that they have the correct processes in place in provisioning, deprovisioning, uh, um, and all kinds of stuff around that. Because if it's a mess, should you trust them? Should you allow access? Because they are still accessing your application but if they have a shitty authentication mechanism or process, probably your security guys will say, no, nah, that's not gonna happen. So make sure you fully trust the identity management processes before even allowing access. And of course, you can then apply, even to your guest accounts, conditional access policies, uh, where you can specify the conditions that should apply, and then uh, uh, also uh, specify which controls the, the, the guest user must fulfill. External identities from uh, sort from other providers. Um, you need to have a guest account in your tenant. That's it. But using authentication from somebody else, it could be an external Azure AD tenant or a Microsoft account or Google Federation. In the past, when you used Google Federation, well, it wasn't Google Federation, but if you used a Google account, a Gmail account, you automatically got a free Microsoft account again, you would have another credential. Another credential that you had to manage. Nobody wants that. So Microsoft, I think since Ignite, they are providing Google Federation, and basically what you're doing is, is you are enabling uh, Google Federation within your tenant, 
once a one-time thing only. <coughs> And then you are able to create guest accounts. Well, you are able to create guest accounts, but as soon as the guest account is created, you will um, um, uh, have the Gmail account access your application through really through Google and not through an intermediate Microsoft account, which was the case in the past. Another one that's new, currently in private preview, is direct federation. Like, for example, ADFS is able to connect multiple identity providers, SAML-based, WS Federation, Azure AD itself in the, let's say, near future will allow that. So you would be able to move all your identity providers to Azure AD. And another, oh, sorry. And another one, that's the last resort, if all your accounts that you have don't fall in these four categories, you still have this one, the one-time password. Let's say that you have a Yahoo account. How are you going to federate with that account? Azure AD at this point in time doesn't provide anything. So the last resort is the one-time password. You still create an account in your tenant. And then as soon as that person access your tenant, um, it gets, e gets a one-time password code emailed to its email account. And that's the password for that session. If they come back the day after, they get another one-time password. So. It's a fallback me mechanism for all kinds of other scenarios that don't fall in one of these four. <clears throat> Additional miscellaneous stuff, uh, guest self-leave, when performing access reviews, um, you need to check if guest accounts need to be available or not. But in this case, people can leave by themselves. Allow and list domains. When you create invitations, you can specify which domains you allow or which domain you do not allow. And one that uh, uh, I found that was important is um, redemption status. In the beginning, you were cre able to create a guest account. I know, I know. <laughs> you were able to create a guest account, and but you would never, you will never able to, to find out, well, yes, through the portal, but if you have a thousand accounts, going through thousands of accounts to see if they had uh, accepted the invocation or not, it's ne not really doable. So through PowerShell, uh, it wasn't possible, but now it is possible because it provides the state of the invitation. Has it been accepted or not? And in this case, it was accepted. <coughs> um, entitled management, guest sales sign up. Um, for example, you might have a company where you only have a few contacts, but you have no idea who you, you, you should invite. So what you do is you create a set of entitlements, and then um, those set of entitlements are accessible through a link. You give that link to the contact of that specific partner that you trust, and then that partner, or that contact within that partner, then he finds out who needs to receive that link. And then through that link, people can then sign up and uh, access your applications. Admin consent, um, important for scenarios where, for example, um, like for applications, user consent, admin consent, uh, and this is between tenants. Um, but also a, t uh, a company that has multiple tenants. You don't want people to consent over and over and over again from the same data. So if you, need, if you set it up between both tenants, both on the hosting uh, tenant and also on the identity tenant, you, as an admin, uh, you can consent for all the users. Well, who doesn't know about conditional access? Nobody? So I think you already covered this, right? My haiku, are you chicken? Do the MFA dance. Now you're hip. <laughs> you're hip now. Oh, you're hip now, sorry. Uh, yeah, this is how I did it for the social media um, applications. What time is it, by the way? Oh, you're like 10 minutes over. Oh. <laughs> so the feedback is we lost a few drinks because of <laughs> Damn. Damn. Sorry. Uh, well, uh, um, sorry? Yeah. So, um, important here is that if you're going to 
provide conditional access for external parties, you need to be aware of a few things, is that if you provide MFA for your external parties, uh, because tenant friending is not available, and I still also don't know what the status is uh, within Microsoft of that. Six days in March. Sorry? Six days in March, according to Okay. And tenant friending yet not being available. Um, if you enable, or, sorry, if you require MFA, and the external party has already registered for MFA, they will need to re-register within your tenant. Um, well, it works, but if you enable the, one of these two, or even both of them, hybrid AD, AD domain join or compliant devices, doesn't work. So those people won't have access. So you can't use that on external parties. Um, also another one is custom MFA. As you can see, I have duo here for internals, but I don't for the externals. And the reason is, it took me a few uh, moments before I got it. Um, well, I never read the, uh, the, 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 the release notes. Uh, I only read them after finding out, hey, why is it not working? And then the release note said, hey, we don't support guest accounts. And also you need to have a look at licensing. So what does it mean if you use the custom MFA provider in terms of licensing? Because regarding Azure AD MFA, if you've got one license, you've got a five additional license for external parties. How does it work for the custom ones? Access reviews, um, it's there. You can perform access reviews against group memberships, app assignments, role assignments through PIM. And one thing for external accounts, as I have set it up, is I have a social media account, which is being um, um, authorized through a group, and then people are in that group. And when you perform access reviews, um, you can review access either through a, a group, a group membership, or an app a application assignment. And if it's a group membership, in the end, when you apply the results of the access review, and you say, hey, let's deny Joe, Joe is remembered from the, uh, uh, removed from the group. But if, if you are using the group for authorization and you are performing an access review through an app assignment, Joe will not be removed from the group because it only looks at the direct app assignment, not through a group. Although it says, hey, I applied it successfully. No, it didn't. So, things to be aware of. This is how, well, how it looks like. You get an email as soon as you start it. Um, review. This one is new. When you can see all the reviews, it will provide you recommendations. You can say, well, yeah, let's just accept the recommendations and those will then be applied. Or if you don't want to, you can select then the users for deny, provide a reason, but also select the users for approval. And uh, if configured, uh, you need to provide a reason why you are approving this. And then when the attestation uh, period is over, you will get a, uh, an additional email. Hey, go and go and go and see the results. And this is how, for example, uh, how, how it may look like. Recommend uh, recommended action and what I did. Well, this is how you migrate. Um, you can read this at home or ask me later during a beer. I'm getting thirsty, sorry. And this is for management. It's a recap of, let's say, everything that we discussed. <clears throat> Any questions? Let's get a beer. <laughs> Thank you.